The Ford Explorer may not be the largest three-row crossover in America, but it is surprisingly practical because we get more cargo space in the rear than you find in something like a Nissan Pathfinder, but we also get more rear passenger legroom especially than we find in something like a Chevy Traverse or a GMC Acadia. The Explorer also recently received a number of changes under the hood, on the inside, and on the outside in order to help keep this model fresh. We're taking a look at the top end platinum trim with the optional twin turbo V6 under the hood. In my opinion, the front end styling is now sort of Ford meets Land Rover, which is somewhat logical because Ford used to own Land Rover. We have new full LED low beam headlamps. The high beams are still halogens and all models get these new headlamps. Our particular model also has fog lamps lower in this front bumper. Those are halogen beams as well. I think from this angle especially, you can see the resemblance between this and the Range Rover Sport especially. We also have a camera right up here under this portion of the grille. At 198.3 inches long, this slots almost exactly between the Highlander, which is 7 inches smaller than this, and the Chevy Traverse, which is 5 inches longer than this. The general design of the Explorer, however, makes this look perhaps a little bit smaller than something like a Nissan Pathfinder, which is actually an inch shorter than the Ford that we're taking a look at. It might be this section of the rear end right here to my eye, because we get a slightly smaller third row window right back here, a larger pillar between the second row area and that third row passenger area, and the cargo compartment in the back. The Ford Explorer is a front wheel drive vehicle by default, so we see a very front wheel drive proportion with a fairly short hood up front, it's different than what we see in the Dodge Durango. The Durango and the Yukon and Tahoe, etc., they get longer hoods. They're slightly bulkier up front because they are designed to have a V8 long ways in the vehicle. It's obvious by the rear end design that the Explorer is a three row crossover because the rear tailgate is relatively vertical when you compare this to something like a Ford Edge which is a large two row crossover. We get LED tail lamps in the back. Ours, of course, is the Platinum model, as I said earlier. So Platinum is right there on the tailgate and we get integrated exhaust tips in the top end models. All models have twin exhaust tips, top end ones, it's integrated into the bumper. Behind a cover in the rear bumper, we find the optional two inch tow receiver, seven pin and four pin wiring harnesses. Towing capacity comes in at either 2,000 pounds for the four cylinder model or 5,000 pounds for the V6s. Under the hood, things are very different than the competition. This does not start out with a four-cylinder engine like we see in the Toyota Highlander, and we don't get a V8 engine like we see in the Dodge Durango. Instead, things start with a 3.5-liter V6 engine. It produces 290 horsepower and 255 pound-feet of torque. That's very similar to the optional engine that we see in the Highlander, the standard engine that we see in a variety of the competition. From there, you can option up into a 2.3-liter turbocharged engine, which is similar to what we see in the brand new Mazda CX-9. This 2.3 liter turbo, however, produces more power at 280 horsepower, about the same kind of torque at 310. From there, we get the only twin turbo V6 in this segment. It's a 3.5 liter twin turbo unit, and it produces 365 horsepower and 350 pound-feet of torque. Depending on the engine that you choose and whether you choose front wheel drive or all wheel drive, your fuel economy will come in between 18 and 22 miles per gallon. That 22 miles per gallon combined may sound a little bit low, but remember that all three of these engines are still using a six-speed automatic transmission. We don't find an eight-speed like we do find in some of the competition. When it comes to front seat comfort, I'm going to give this 9 out of 10 points. Our top end trim gets a three position seat memory that's also linked to the power adjustable pedals and the four-way tilt telescopic power steering column. We have a four-way adjustable lumbar support and a multi-way adjustable driver's seat with a four-way adjustable headrest. As we recently have seen in the Ford F-Series pickup trucks and the Lincoln MKX, these seats also contain a massage function. There are air bladders in the seat bottom cushion and in the seat back cushion that help to reduce fatigue and help improve circulation on long road journeys. That really improves the front seat comfort. On the downside, however, the seat bottom cushion is a little bit short for my tastes. Taller drivers especially may find that they lack thigh support because of the length of this seat bottom cushion. Shorter drivers, however, should be just fine. Although the Explorer is not the largest entry in this segment, combined legroom is very generous, and that would be front row plus second row plus third row. Sitting right here in the middle seat with the front seat adjusted for me very comfortably at six feet tall, I still have about four inches of legroom left. The second row seat can also be slid forward and backward to help apportion the space a little bit more equitably. Unlike some of the competition, the Explorer is only available in six or seven passenger versions. There's no eight passenger version because the third row is always a two person bench. The model that we're taking a look at is the six passenger version. So there's no middle seat right here. 
If I move on over to the right side of the vehicle, you'll notice this front seat was very comfortably adjusted for a six foot five person. He actually ended up sitting a little bit closer to the dashboard than I was, so I have more leg room over here on this side. We have a center console that opens up with a padded armrest and a very deep storage well instead of a middle seat. Getting into the third row is fairly easy. We simply fold the second row forward and then we pull this little fabric webbing right here, tumble the seat forward to help you get into the third row. You can also do this electrically. We just press this button right here on the side. The seat will tumble forward right like that. Although I have yet to find any third row seat that's overtly comfortable outside a conversion van, this is one of the most comfortable third rows available in the United States. This second row seat is slid all the way back in its tracks, suitable for a six foot five passenger in this third row. That front seat again had a six foot five passenger in it, same person I had sit in both ways. And back here, my knee is brushing the back of this seat, but it's not touching it. That means that this is an awful lot more comfortable for me at six feet tall. If I lean back, my head barely touches the ceiling, but it's not really digging in. If you slouched a little bit, you would definitely be okay back here. Again, this is not a three row bench in the third row. This is just a two person. So one right over here and then one over here on this other side. The Explorer that Ford sent us is the six passenger model. There's no center seat right here in the second row. And therefore we won't have our traditional child seat review of this vehicle because I was not able to actually fully test the Explorer. However, I will say that for rearward facing child seats, the Explorer is very accommodating. We again have some of the largest combined legroom figures that you see in any three row vehicle in the United States. That's front row plus second row plus third row. And that does affect the child seat score when it comes to especially putting rear facing seats in the back here. The seat's not actually latched in place. If it was, it would actually move about an inch further rearward. Definitely enough clearance between the front seat and the child seat. If multiple child seats are a big part of your family life, you should know that getting into the third row with two child seats in the second row is a little bit tricky in the Explorer. In something like a Nissan Pathfinder, you could leave the child seat latched into place. That would be using the latch anchors only and fold the seat forward, still have access to the third row fairly easily. You can't do that in the Explorer. Although the Explorer is not as long as something like a Chevy Traverse, the cargo area is actually a little bit more practical. This has quite a minivan-like cargo area. You can see that it extends about eight to 10 inches below this load in height right here. As you can see, you can lay a 22 inch roller bag in this position completely inside that cargo well, or you can stand them up right like this and you could put about four or five of them right across the back behind the third row seats. When it comes to our new luggage test with our hard sided 24 inch roller bags, these are a little bit too large to carry on most domestic flights. I was only able to fit three across the back. However, that's still significantly more than you'll find in any other three row crossover behind the third row. At this point, you may be thinking to yourself, that's lovely, but obviously the Explorer doesn't have a spare tire. You would actually be wrong because there is a compact spare tire under the cargo area load floor even though this cargo area load floor is so low. When it comes to our new luggage score, we came in at three slash nine. We were able to fit three bags behind the third row, and we were able to fit nine in this upright position behind the second row quite safely. In this position, none of these suitcases will roll or fly forward in the event of an accident, and we can quite easily close the hatchback. Since we're in the top end platinum trim, we have platinum embroidered on the seats right there. These seats are ventilated as well as heated, and it also features a variety of different stitching patterns right there on the seat surface, the bottom and the seat back. The door panels in our platinum model feature a large portion of stitched materials. So we have stitched leather on the top, and then we have quilted leather in this section right here above the armrest, aluminum trim and wood trim combining right there on the door panel. The stitch materials continue all the way over to the dashboard. We see a stitch line right there and a seam right down here more wood trim right over here and a large glove compartment that has a two tiered arrangement, a bin style and a slot right there as well. One nice touch is that the stitched material goes right down here to where your knees would bang on the center console. In the center of the dashboard, we find two large air vents and the touchscreen infotainment system. Our model still has the old My Ford touch system. However, Sync 3 should be available in models that you'll see on the dealership lot. You'll notice that this screen right here is where you adjust the three position lumbar support and the massaging option for the seat. We just hit this button right here. We choose off, high or low for the driver and front passenger seat. Below the screen, we find the buttons for the camera system, self parking, parking sensors right here, button to shortcut us to the sound options and an eject button for the single slot optical disc player. Continuing down from that, we have a traditional console shifter. Sport mode is all the way down towards the bottom. Drive is one step up from there. If you want manual mode, that's available via shift paddles on the steering wheel. We have a storage cubby right under this little door, and that's where you'll find a single USB input, the SD card for the mapping database, and a 12 volt power outlet. More than enough room in here to store something like an iPhone 6, and we get a little cutout right there, so that way your cable can come out of 
right there rather than being pinched on that little door. Between the front seats, we find two very large cup holders and the terrain management dial. This is very similar to what we see in some of the other luxury SUVs out there. Between the front seats, we find a softly padded center armrest. It opens to reveal a little slot right here that can be removed for pens, pencils, change, that sort of thing. It's a deep well, you can easily put a wide variety of things inside. And we have an additional USB port behind that little door. On the driver's side, our model has a partial LCD instrument cluster. This is similar to what we see in certain Lincoln models. We have a tachometer over here on the left. These numbers on this ring, they're actually physical as well as those lines. However, on the inside, we have an LCD that stretches right from here, and that little indicator right there, the little needle itself, is actually digital as well. And that stretches all the way over here to that ring on the speedometer on the right side. The inside of the speedometer is another LCD. This is actually a circular LCD, and that gives us this digital fuel gauge, as well as the screen in the middle and the dial. Because we're in the Platinum trim, we get a partial wood steering wheel, and this wood portion is also heated. That's something that we don't see even in certain luxury vehicles, where just the leather portions of the steering wheel are heated. This is a almost three-spoke design with a cutout right here in the bottom spoke. Acceleration in this twin-turbo V6 model is very good for this segment. We ran from 0 to 60 in 6.3 seconds, which makes this just about 3 to 4 tenths of a second slower than the Dodge Durango. The Dodge Durango does have a slightly more powerful V8 engine in it, and it also has an 8-speed automatic transmission. And I think the transmission really is the differentiator between this and something like the Durango. We've not had the opportunity to test the four-cylinder turbocharged engine in the Explorer. However, the base V6 engine is very comparable to the optional V6 that we see in something like a Toyota Highlander when it comes to 0-60 to 60 performance. Braking distances were exceptional in the Explorer. We went from 60 to 0 in 112 feet, which is incredibly short. The tire selection on our Platinum model has a big impact on the braking scores, obviously, but also the brake design and the suspension design play here as well. Thanks to the tires and the suspension design, I'm also going to give handling an A. The grip is excellent in this vehicle for a three-row crossover. This definitely road holds better than something like a Chevy Traverse, a GMC Acadia, a Toyota Highlander, Honda Pilot, etc. When it comes to handling feel, however, the Explorer does lag behind the Dodge Durango, which is the best in this segment in my opinion, and the brand new Mazda CX-9. The CX-9 gives us definitely more road feel, the steering is a little bit more accurate than we see in this Explorer, but the actual handling ability is fairly similar to what we see in that Mazda CX-9. The handling ability is helped out by a moderately firm suspension. I'm going to give this overall a B when it comes to the ride as a result. Our Platinum Tester also has 20 inch wheels and tires on it, and that does reduce the amount of cushion that you get out of the tires themselves. Out on a long highway journey, you can definitely feel the expansion joints more in this Platinum model than you can in the lower end trims. When it comes to our cabin noise score, this vehicle scored an A. We came in at 71 decibels at 50 miles an hour, which puts us among the quieter entries in this segment. Fuel economy is really the one area where the Explorer lags the competition. The combined EPA rating ranges from 18 to 22, depending on the engine and the drivetrain that you get, whether you're getting front wheel drive or all wheel drive. The model that we've been driving here has been averaging about 16 miles per gallon, however. This is the all wheel drive twin turbo model that is definitely a little bit below what the EPA says you're going to get. I've mentioned fuel economy with other turbocharged vehicles before. Certain turbocharged engine designs have troubles meeting EPA fuel economy averages in real world driving. Part of the reason for that is just the way that people drive. Obviously, there's far more power on tap from this engine than you would find in your average 3.5 liter V6. The other thing that happens with some modern turbocharged engine designs is that they end up injecting extra fuel into the cylinder to help cool the cylinder itself down. I realize it sounds a little bit odd to inject something flammable into a cylinder to try and cool it down, but the reason is that they're injecting more fuel than can actually burn inside the cylinder, and that does have a net cooling effect. Whether or not the engine computer ends up injecting more fuel into the cylinder depends on a wide variety of different factors, and some engine designs seem to do this a little bit more often than others. That does play into some of the fuel economy difference, especially if it's hot outside, or the vehicle is being driven hard, or you're towing, something along those lines. Before we dive right into the pricing section, I should tell you that the pricing that we'll be talking about is all 2017 pricing. There really haven't been very many changes between 2016 and 2017. The biggest thing, of course, is as I said earlier, you'll find the all-new SYNC 3 infotainment system in the 2017 model. You didn't find that in the 2016 model year vehicle. Now let's dive into the details. The Explorer comes in six different forms at the moment in the United States. We have the base model starting at $31,160, and that gets the V6 engine standard. 
We then get the XLT trim, which I consider to be the true base version of the Explorer because it gives you features that I suspect most shoppers will be looking for, and that includes the LED headlamps, parking sensors, and the keyless entry and go. Jumping up to the $41,225 limited trim, you exchange the V6 engine for a standard 2.3 liter turbocharged engine. Again, that sounds somewhat similar to what we see in the Mazda CX-9 that's all new this year. However, the Ford engine produces considerably more power. We also get things like the heated steering wheel, power lift gate, leather seats, etc. When you jump up to the 3.5 liter twin turbo engine, all wheel drive becomes standard and that's on both the Sport and the Platinum versions. The Sport gets 20 inch wheels and the Class 3 tow package, also standard. The Platinum gives us things like active park, the double moonroof, adaptive cruise control, the blind spot warning system, lane departure warning, etc. Personally, I think the best value in the Explorer is in the limited trim. We get that 2.3 liter four cylinder engine. We also get leather upholstery, a lot of the other niceties that people are expecting in a nicely loaded three row crossover these days. If I had to choose between the Sport and the Platinum, I would actually choose the Platinum trim. The main reason for that is that the Sport is not any faster, but the Platinum is nicer on the inside. We also get those features like the active parking system, the double pane moonroof, we get the multi-contour seats, which are quite simply the most comfortable seats you can get in this particular segment. The anti-fatigue function really makes those more comfortable for long car trips. They're gonna be considerably more comfortable with that massaging function than some of the other seats in this segment if you're taking the car out on a three or four or five hour drive. Now let's talk about how the Explorer compares with the competition. The key thing here to remember is that the Explorer is one of the larger vehicles on the inside in this segment. I specify on the inside because earlier we were talking about exterior dimensions with that ruler that you saw earlier in the video and the Explorer is not as large as something like a Chevy Traverse. But when you actually take a look at how much leg room and how much cargo room you get on the inside, you can see that the packaging is very, very efficient with the Explorer. The size difference on the inside is very obvious when you take a look at something like the Honda Pilot. The Explorer is a little bit larger on the outside, but it's a great deal larger on the inside. We have considerably more legroom, and we have a cargo area that's about 30% larger than the Honda. In order to get the luxury features that we see in upper end trims of the Explorer, you do have to get the 9-speed automatic transmission in the Pilot. Honda is giving you two different transmissions in that vehicle. Base versions get a 6-speed automatic transmission that Honda makes themselves. Upper end versions get a 9-speed automatic transmission that's essentially the same as we see in certain Jaguar Land Rover products and certain Chrysler products. The downside is that that 9-speed automatic transmission, while it does give you better fuel economy and better acceleration, has a very unusual driving feel to it. The Explorer is going to feel very traditional, very much like every other 6-speed automatic transmission out there. Honda's Pilot is likely going to be a little bit less expensive to repair in the long run. However, we really don't know what that 9-speed automatic transmission's repair bills will be like yet. When it comes to driving dynamics, the Pilot does very well for itself because it is one of the lighter entries in this segment, and that really helps when it comes to acceleration as well as handling. Of course, Ford counters the acceleration by giving you optional turbocharged engines that we just don't see in the Honda. We have the 2.3 liter turbo, and we have the 3.5 liter twin turbo. The result is that the top end trims of the Explorer are definitely more engaging to drive than the Pilot. Next up, we have the Toyota Highlander, which is actually about a half step smaller than the Explorer. It's about 7.2 inches shorter in overall length. And that's really obvious when you take a look at the rear seat compartment, where we have three inches less legroom than we have in the Explorer. We also have about half the cargo space that we find in the Ford. When you're comparing any three row vehicle, I think the most important statistic to keep in mind is combined legroom. That's front row plus second row plus third row. There are some entries in this segment that advertise a larger third row legroom number, but when you take a look at the total available legroom in the vehicle, the Ford is right at the top of the segment. And that's very important, especially in vehicles where you can slide the second row forward and backward to apportion the space a little bit more equitably. It means that at six feet tall, I can sit in the front row, in the second row, and in the third row of the Explorer very comfortably. You can't do that to the same extent in the Highlander. The Highlander's third row especially is quite compact. The Highlander also ends up being more expensive than the Ford. It may seem like it's cheaper, starting at $30,490, but you have to keep in mind that we get a standard four-cylinder engine in the Highlander, not the V6 that we see in the Explorer, and by the time you've comparably equipped it, you're going to be a few thousand dollars more than the Ford. 
A number of you on Facebook asked me to compare the Explorer to the Dodge Durango and the Jeep Grand Cherokee. The Grand Cherokee and the Durango are related, and you should really think of them as the two-row and the three-row crossover from Chrysler. The Grand Cherokee is, of course, the two-row model with a large cargo area behind. The Durango is a little bit longer, and it has a third row and a small cargo area behind the third row. The Durango and the Grand Cherokee march to very different drummers. They're the only rear-wheel drive entries in this particular segment. The rear-wheel drive layout means that they're less space efficient. So if we take a look at the overall length of the Durango versus the interior dimensions, you'll actually find a little bit more room in the Explorer. The big thing to keep in mind is that the Durango is the only rear-wheel drive entry in this crossover segment, and that means that it's less efficient in terms of overall packaging. Even though the Durango is about three inches longer than the Explorer, the combined legroom, and that's again those three rows, is actually three inches less than we find in the Explorer. The Explorer will also give you a larger cargo area. On the flip side, the Durango can have a V8 engine, and it's a great deal more fun to drive than the Explorer. It has a very nimble handling dynamic because it's actually closely related to the Mercedes-Benz E-Class. You can think of it sort of as an E-Class with a much bigger box on top. It has a nearly perfect 50-50 weight balance. It has a ZF 8-speed automatic transmission, the same transmission that Audi and BMW use. It has an excellent driving dynamic out on the road. It's just not as space efficient. It's also not quite as comfortable. The front seats that we find in the Durango especially are not nearly as comfortable as the top end seats that we find in the Explorer. The Grand Cherokee is a little bit tricky because there was a time where the Grand Cherokee and the Explorer competed more or less directly, but these days they've gone in very different directions. In addition to being a two-row vehicle, not a three-row vehicle, the Grand Cherokee also has a solid off-road mission. We have available air suspensions, we have that two-speed transfer case, V8 engines, diesel engines available, etc. It's just a very different vehicle overall. If you're comparing top-end versions of the Grand Cherokee and top-end versions of the Explorer as sort of an alternative to a European luxury SUV or crossover, then I can see what's going on there. I would actually say that they end up just about equal. I like certain things about the Explorer's interior and certain things about the Grand Cherokee's interior. I think that attention to detail is a little higher in the Grand Cherokee. The way seams meet in the Grand Cherokee and top-end trims, the stitched leather dashboard, stitched leather doors, etc. It has a slightly more premium look to it. However, the Explorer actually has a slightly more premium feel. It seems like all the parts are actually of similar quality. The interior in the Jeep has those stitched leather parts above the midpoint in the cabin, but then below that point in the cabin, you can find some plastics that seem a little bit out of place. The brand new Mazda CX-9 is easily the freshest entry in this segment. I think it's also arguably the most attractive. Unfortunately, the only engine on offer in the CX-9 is a 2.3 liter four-cylinder turbocharged engine, and it produces significantly less power than any of the engines in the Explorer lineup, including Ford's own 2.3 liter turbo. The mission of Mazda's turbo and Ford's turbo were very different. Ford is obviously looking for performance out of their turbocharged engine, Mazda was going after high fuel economy, and the CX-9 has one of the highest fuel economy ratings in any three-row crossover segment. In terms of feature content, value, and pricing, mid-level trims and lower-end trims of the CX-9 compare very, very well to the Explorer. I'd personally pick lower-end and mid-level trims of the CX-9 over the Ford Explorer. The overall look is much more premium, the interior is definitely fresher, and Mazda has really taken a lot of care to make the interior one of the best in this segment. The seats are also comfortable, and I think that the value is definitely there for the CX-9. Unfortunately, if you're taking a look at top-end trims, for instance, the Sport or the Platinum version of the Explorer, the Mazda CX-9's comparison seems to fall apart a little bit because we still get that very slow 2.3-liter turbocharged engine. And of course, in the Ford, with that 3.5-liter V6, it's going to be considerably faster 0 to 60. The Mazda CX-9 does have a very engaging feel out on the road, but it's not going to handle any better than the Explorer. Although the light curb weight we see in the CX-9 really improves the dynamics, you'll notice that the vehicle overall is not packaged as efficiently as the Ford either. Even though the CX-9 is a little bit longer, it actually has 3.6 inches less legroom than the Ford. Nissan's Pathfinder has a well-deserved reputation for being the family three-row crossover. It's big, it's softly sprung, it's comfortable, and it has a second row seat that allows you to keep a forward-facing child seat latched into position and still move that seat forward to get into the third row. It's also one of the few vehicles in this segment that beats the Ford when it comes to combined legroom. And again, that is front, mid, and third row together. 
Unfortunately, the cargo area is about 25% smaller than the Ford, so while you may have a little bit more room for people inside, you won't have as much room for cargo. The driving nature of the Pathfinder is decidedly less sporty than the Ford. However, it is a little bit more comfortable for long highway trips, and the fuel economy is significantly better. You can get up to 27 miles per gallon on the highway, and the average that we received when driving the Explorer on our weekly drive and the Pathfinder on our weekly drive was about four miles per gallon difference. That's a pretty big difference in a three row crossover segment. For 2017, Nissan has refreshed the Pathfinder, but there aren't too many differences. We have a new front bumper, a new rear bumper, a tweaked engine, a tweaked infotainment system, and other than that, basically everything else remains the same. My top pick in this particular segment continues to be the Dodge Durango, but as I've said before, it is the odd duck out. So if you're going to exclude the Dodge Durango from your three row crossover shopping, then I'd actually take the Explorer before most of the other vehicles in this segment. If you're looking for base or perhaps mid-level trims, I would take the CX-9 over the Explorer, but if you're looking at the Explorer Limited or above, then I would take the Ford over the Mazda. The Mazda is a very sexy crossover, but that 2.3 liter engine is just a little bit too slow for my tastes. You also, again, don't find the same luxury and convenience features in the Mazda that you do find in the Ford. As always, thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Be sure and like and share this video. Comment down there. Let me know what you think about the Ford Explorer. Find me over at facebook.com slash and I'll see you next week. not driving on the road. Whoa. Whoa. We're like, we're like using both lanes today. I guess you pay taxes on both lanes. You might as well use them both.